Yes. <laughs> Right. Happy hey, Thursday. Guys. And to our guest, happy Friday. Oh, happy we'll Friday. In a second. What Hello the? and welcome to season two, episode 29 of Carvers and Creators, a weekly demonstration and discussion with pumpkin carvers, sculptors, and multi-talented artists. We ask that you please give us a like and a follow on the platform you're watching us on. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from and if you have any questions for the carvers and our special guest. Let's meet the Carvers. First, he's an artist and sculptor from Boston, Massachusetts. He's a 2019 champion of Food Network's Outrageous Pumpkins. Paul Dever, welcome. Yeah. Oh, happy Thursday, everybody. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Wait, did you just have sound effects, Mickey? Is that what I heard? I did. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? There couldn't be a crowd in his background? Maybe he's like, okay. Studio oh, audience. Yeah. <laughs> you pull the string again next time. <laughs> <laughs> next, he's a multimedia sculpture artist from Tucson, Arizona, and a finalist on Halloween Wars 2019 on the Food Network, Matt Harper. Oh, oh please. Hello. Hello. Matty. Oh, the crowd. The crowd. <laughs> the crowd <laughs> nuts. Our guest tonight is a makeup effects artist, an illustrator, a sculpture artist, a digital effects artist extraordinaire whose credits include Avatar, Alien, Iron Man, Independence Day, Men in Black, Godzilla, Lord of the Rings, to name a few. Here live from New Zealand, please welcome the iconic Gino Acevedo. Wow. Yes. Hello, Gino, Gino. Gina, uh, we gotta get better sound effects for him. That's, that was awesome. <laughs> oh man, that pitch is great too. I love it. Hey, uh, look at that guy. Hey, my yeah. name is Michael Mondrag, and I'll be running the show, moderating comments, and chiming in from time to time. Let's check out our uh, carves from last week. The carving subject was euphoric amphibian, and oh, yeah. uh, Matt, yeah. awesome. Tell yeah, this this, uh, this started as a just a little kabocha squash and it, had, it was kind of small, but um, it had perfect lumps in the front to make him have kind of a, a, a frog like, you know, structure uh, in the front. And um, so, you know, you, amphibians don't have these kind of teeth, but this one did. So therefore there he is, you know, you know, he's a euphoric amphibian. I, I was, I was a little on the fence with it. I, I um, you know, you always hate Gino. You, you probably do this too. We, we end up hating and loving our carbs like 11 different times while we're making them. And, um, but the interesting thing with produce is the damn stuff rots. So, so eventually you have to stop carving. You can't walk away and come back a week later. So, um, you kind of just have to go and I, I I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm happy with it, but it's, um, you know, that's my, uh, yeah. Okay. There we go. I'll that's stop nice. the, the, the smile reminds me of Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love the teeth. It's, it's, great. it's euphoric, right? So and yeah. euphoric would be a smile. And, and you nailed those teeth so early, too, last week. It was – you went right to work on them. It was awesome to watch. So yep. once, I got, once I got the face, the, the structure, like where the mouth was going to be, I kind of struggled with the eyes and the rest of it. But to me, the, um, that, was the, that was the most fun part to work on, for sure. Oh, you nailed it. Great how, how long do you guys have to work on these? I mean, before it starts to get mushy and everything. Yeah, great question. So I think um, we do an hour and a half on the show, um, and then typically Paul and I will go uh, refrigerate them, you know, put them in some water, keep them in the fridge like any piece of produce you would, and then that'll keep a day or two, uh, and we can get back to it and kind of put another few hours into it, maybe at the most. Um, mm -hmm. Before and but I've experimented with it and like pushed it and made it in mid next week, and it's too late. It, it starts to kind of soften too much to make it. Because this is, you know, you have pumpkins, they're pretty firm, and, and these things have that same consistency, really, you know, really heavy, thick, but, you know, fine detail, you can still get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Until, I, you wait, until you wait too long, then you're screwed. Yeah, working time altogether, I'd say, well, we put in about three or four hours now, but the, the lifespan of it from the time you break the skin, that candy coating on the outside, till the time yeah. it's, no, it's no longer viable as a sculptural specimen three or four days yeah you know you can kind of make them last like matt said keep them cool keep them moist 
but the, t the clock's ticking no matter what we don't we can't go back to it and you know next week right yep. yeah and here's Very paul's cool. from last week as well <laughs> yeah, i love it that's great yeah. paul the addition of the legs it just like makes that thing so much better that's so it, awesome it needed it otherwise it was it was like an undeveloped uh tadpole <laughs> you know what i mean I was kind of on that, uh, just watching all the CNN stuff. So I was like, "Hey, man, peace, man." <laughs> I started thinking of like, like Woodstock in the '60s. Like, "Hey, I took the brown acid, man. <laughs> I licked my cousin the toad's back, man." <laughs> well, that'll make you euphoric for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, the Guatemalan yeah, insanity toad. He's, uh, you guys, he's you guys are great. What I love, what I love about it is like just the the fleshiness of the material because it is it does have a translucency to it. You know, like yeah, a lot of look. that we work with, but also, but not only that, but just the way that you guys are carving it. I mean, you guys know your forms and your your uh, softness of how pillowing, you know, the wrinkles go and everything. So, yeah, great job. Thank you yeah. very much. That means a lot. That means a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I work in vectors and pixels. So here is my offering for today. Yeah, amphibian. <laughs> uh, we were saying that it looks. Uh, th th my work is starting to look like album cover, so I actually put it on an album cover. Yes. Um, and if Dude. you get this reference, you may be a hundred years old. Um, the... Yeah, uh, Froggy yeah. from from Little Rascals. <laughs> yeah, yes. He like that. Yeah. Yes. He like yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Dude. He was amazing. <laughs> Love that. Nick, show. They're getting better and better. Like it. it oh, literally. Everything you come up with is a concert T-shirt or an album cover, and I, it's amazing. <laughs> I actually had this as uh, just a regular graphic, and then I'm like, oh, I need to put it in like an old album. And so, I right before the show, I did it. So, oh, uh, again, I'm pushing myself. Wow. Even the, the stickers, the stickers and the, bent, the burnt edges and stuff, Mickey. This is this is badass. <laughs> well, done, thank man. you so much. Yeah, it's definitely. I love doing this challenge. Uh, so, Gino, I'd like to introduce you to the fourth member of carvers and creators responsible for choosing our carving subject tonight. It is the hollow wheel, the center spinner, and Paul will tell you more about it right now. Uh-oh, here we go. I would love to. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Gino for joining us as well. This is I'm the fighting. wheel. Everybody that knows the routine of this is we spin it twice. The first time is gonna be what we carve. As far as the subject, second spin is going to be the emotion of which we have to try to relay. So our choices tonight, in honor of Gino, we have Orc on the wheel. There's also Nightmare Fuel, Voluptuous, Fantasy, Psychopathic, Outer Space, Guest Choice, Gollum, Primate, and Villain. Oh. Some damn choices there, kids. Those are some choices. So now... The second spin will be sulking, terrified, bored, irritated, elated, grizzled, stoned, euphoric, confused, and repulsive. What, what yeah, could go wrong? He's a kid. I, I go through those emotions every day. <laughs> I did. I did well reading them. <laughs> oh, please don't land on certain things. There we go. All right, here we go. What's it gonna be? Gollum. Oh, Gollum. <laughs> wow. Uh, please drop a bag of $100 bills in my lap. Yeah, time. come on. I need that kind of thing. Bored Gollum. There you go. Bored, Bored Gollum. Gollum. Bored. Bored stiff. He stopped looking for the ring. He started eating Cheetos. Nothing on TV is good enough. He's just wow. Okay. What I am world. writing this one down, Mickey, because even though you have it on there, I will tomorrow I'll forget it. So four. <clears throat> oh my god, I wish I could wipe it from my memory right now. <laughs> I don't even know. Oh man, this is a good one. This is a good challenge. I need a bulbous, I need something that's golemish. Yeah, I, I, I have one of the, I have one of these suckers still. Do you really go golem oh, headed? Yeah. But I don't know. Mm. This is I got one of these one. Like, chodes too, so I don't know. Chino, you couldn't have worked on Disney films. <laughs> <laughs> then you would have been doing Little Mermaid or something, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. Exactly. Man, yeah. I mean that's a that's a big pill to swallow. That's one of the most iconic characters in movie yeah. history. Like yeah. everybody knows Gollum. My kid, I had to tell him my oldest son at one point when the the ring when the rings were like at the height of everything to stop walking around saying my precious. 
I'm like, you're going to get stuck talking like that. <laughs> it was just fun. <laughs> My pet <pants>, Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, and we, and I, I know we, we, uh, we have a couple more little things we talk about, but there is an amazing and beautiful story about Gollum we're going to hear very shortly. But um, it, it's, it's even scarier knowing who we have on with us that we're doing this. I'm like, well, I, now, now, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm just going to sit there and watch the whole time. I'm not even going to do what you're doing, Paul. I'm just going to. I'll just hold this right here and just hug him for a little while or something. I, I, I was kind of thinking of the same plan. It was I would let you carve. <laughs> no way, man. Listen, that's the wheel does, right? And you got to rise to the occasion. We have a that's right. amazing that's right. guest, and we can't let him down. Besides, I don't know if you know this or not. I don't know if Gino knows this or not either. But this is for an apprenticeship with Gino. Right. Yeah. We're flying out I, I, to Wellington tomorrow. And, I just uh, have to let my wife and kids know that I'm moving to New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> plenty, of room, plenty of room for you. Well, How are you going to take your golf clubs? Uh, uh, you know, nothing. No, don't worry about that. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll just cast them when I get down there. It's fine. I'm going to learn how to make molds. I'll just cast the golf clubs. We, we just don't have orange pumpkins down here, but it doesn't look like you need them. You know? I'll yeah, bring yeah. seeds. We got green we'll ones. grow our own. Yeah. So if you're going to create with us, we're going to give you about five minutes to get the tools or whatever you're going to create with. Uh, while we do that, we're going to go around the horn and see what our carving oil is for tonight. Um, I'll start with our guest. Uh, what New Zealand elixir do you have tonight? <laughs> the, the elixir tonight will be a, a very nice uh, New Zealand Chardonnay. Oh, oh nice. which is done. actually nice. Absolutely. Chardonnay. Okay. I love the wines it. out here. The wines out here are pretty amazing. Yes, Fantastic. my wife loves New Zealand wine. Yeah. Wow. Right on, uh, Matt. What do you got? Okay, I, 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 you know, in all due respect, I wanted to find a New Zealand beer, and so I scoured a couple of different places. And in, in Tucson, Arizona, it's 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 not easy to find New Zealand beer. Apparently, I'm, I'm sure it exists. So um, I ended up finding something that I thought was kind of a cool logo, at least to me. Just this is from the Rogue. Oh wow! Um, uh, where is Rogue Mickey? You would know this. It's um, it's in Oregon, I believe. Oregon, okay. And this one's called Dead Guy Ale, and uh, for not for no other reason than it had a cool outside sticker thingy. So I was like, all right, I'll do to that. So yep. who, who knows how it'll taste? But I'm, I'm a sucker for really cool art. So I'll, yeah, I'll... Ro Rogue also does a uh, a a collaboration with Voodoo Donuts up there. So oh, they, they have a lot of donuts. Great. That's yeah. Great name. Yeah, they have yeah. some great stuff up there. So I'll get that next time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Paul, what do you got? Okay, now that I just read my can to figure it out. It, <laughs> I have a ski trip coming up, a big one on Saturday with my company. So this is Ski the East. It's a Hazy Mountain IPA. It's a refreshing alpine taste, in case you were wondering. Uh, and it is from work. Long Trail Brewing in Vermont. And right. it is... Uh, one PINT, as we all know, yes. and 6.8. Nice. And it's, it's, a, it's got that, you know, how they put those cool um, matte stickers on them and it just feels nice to the touch. I don't mm -hmm. even want to drink it. I just kind of want to pet it like a kid. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's so, it's so soothing. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Uh, and so Paul's got the East coast craft beer covered. I have the West coast with the El Segundo brewing Estrada. Nice. Uh, you, you may recognize uh, El Segundo Brewing. Um, they do the Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, uh, beer IPA. So, um, yeah, great brewery out of uh, El Segundo. That's where I lost my wallet. I keep oh. you know what, as soon as you say, and I just heard it this week too. So it was fresh <laughs> in my head. I left my wallet in El Segundo. I thought you were going to pull up like a Schlitz or something. Oh, <laughs> oh, a pull tab? That'd be dynamite. That would be good. Maybe That'll be the throw. We'll do like a throwback episode where we got to find an old, outdated beer that's still viable. Right on. Let's well, cheers. cheers yeah. Oh, yeah. Cheers, everyone. Clink. Thank you so much. I got Clink my iced tea. It's, it's too too early for me with you guys. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> that's um, right. It's, so, just to remind everybody, it's, it's one o'clock in the afternoon in beautiful on Wellington. Friday. On, on Friday. Friday, yeah. So he he knows how. Um, yeah, he knows how the rest of our day went and how Friday morning went for all of us so far. Yes, so, and well, no orange pumpkins in in yeah. New Zealand. That's I haven't seen any. That's wow. crazy. 
So that's fun. what the future holds, people. Yes. No orange pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you got to look forward to. Indeed. Indeed. Well, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover with with uh, you know. So let let's let's start out with this. So obviously, you're a fan of pop culture, as we all are. This is how this is why we do what we do. So let's start there. How how did you get your start and your your passions, your beginnings? Well, it started a long, long time ago, but I've just always had this thing for monsters and monster movies and that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget this magazine, this particular ma magazine, uh, Monster World. Uh, I'll never forget, I was with my mom, and I must have been about maybe five years old, five or six. And we were going through the grocery store. And, you know, as you go through the checkouts, how they have the magazine rack there and everything. And I saw this there, and I thought, oh, my God. Because the color and the creature and everything just, just jumped out at me. And I grabbed it and I said, I looked at it, I was flicking through the, the pages and I said, mom, mom, can I please have it? She looked at it, she goes, oh God, no, that's that's horrible. No, it's gonna give me nightmares. <laughs> like, no, it's not, no, it's not, gonna, please, please, you know, I'll, 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 I'll clean my bedroom, I'll brush my teeth, I'll clean up the dog poop. And so, and mom was so lovely, she, 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 she bought it for me. So wow. that was kind of, kind of a start, I think. And uh, I remember just going through the, the magazine, but it, they showed uh, like a lot of the, uh, uh, movies like behind the scenes photos, which is really cool. And a lot of the makeup artists and how they actually made the prosthetics and, and things like that. And I was just blown away by it. Uh, but again, just always loving the monsters and, and, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where I, where I grew up, um, on Saturday mornings, uh, uh, you might remember this, Matt, do you remember world beyond? Oh, absolutely. We'll be yeah. Godzilla movies. Everything was on. Yeah, that's beautiful. Dracula, Creature from the Black Lagoon, which is yeah. one of my favorites. You can see it here. But um, but on, on Saturday mornings at 10, every 1030, 1030 to noon, uh, World Beyond was on and they showcased, you know, one of these famous classic universal uh, horror movies. And and uh, all my friends, you know, knew that Gino wouldn't come out to play uh, until after, <laughs> after uh, World Beyond was finished because he was watching those stupid monster movies. Um, but yeah, and I just, you know, grew up loving that stuff. And the other passion that I always had was uh, was animals. And the other thing that I loved was, was apes. I was always ape crazy. And and it wasn't until um, when I saw Planet of the Apes. It probably I wasn't. I was maybe. 10 or 12 years old when I finally got to see Planet of the Apes. And that just blew me away because, you know, here, here are these apes and they're talking. It's like, you know, yeah. and yeah. they just look so real. And then I got to see this amazing documentary um, by this uh, the artist who created him. And his name was John Chambers. And John came up with the material, the foam rubber that was used for the actual prosthetics and things. And uh, I'll show you, I'm, I'm such a, a huge Planet of the Apes fan. This is, this is my daughter. Now you can see her here. Oh, and get the reflection out. No way. And I would make up uh, her name's Ruby, and I would make her up every 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 Halloween as a, as a different character. But this was this is probably my favorite one that we did of uh, of uh, the Planet of the Apes. And uh, oh, there she is. Yeah, okay. That's like, is. That, that, was, that was another one we did with with the werewolf. And uh, oh she's fifteen God. now, and it's like, no, no, Dad, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want that crap on my face. You know, it's gonna make my skin break out. It's like, oh, come on, please. You know, so <laughs> so may, maybe in another year or two, maybe she'll get back into it. Wow, that's like camera ready Halloween makeup. Oh my god! Man, and we would go to this so thing. Cool. I work at a company in, in town called Weta. Uh, I started out with uh, Richard Taylor at Weta Workshop, and then I transferred over to Weta Digital. Um, but every year, um, Weta Digital would have a, a Halloween party for the kids, and um, and so I would take Ruby oh. dressed up like this, and you know, a lot of the the other dads, said, oh yeah, great, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I get in the cardboard box as a robot, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got the advantage. This is, this is this is my life growing up, you know. So I'm reliving yeah. my reliving my being a kid again, you know, through my through my daughter. Oh, I love uh, that. But anyways, I take Ruby through there, and she goes, "Dad, everybody's looking at me," and I said, "Well, that's the whole point." And it's like, yeah. it's great. Oh, that's <laughs> so <scary>. cool. <laughs> so now I, I remember her. She, the, the female character has always got a really strong character in that show, if I remember right. Like zero. Back to, yes. Okay. That's I was trying to remember the name of the. The character and they were always the one who were bossing the stupid men around and you know making sure that you know they they did the right thing even though it was yeah i that's just such a like instantly that's 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 her that's so that's such a great picture yeah. fantastic so good. Uh, but to, i guess to continue on with the story and how i you know got to where i am is um 
uh, in Phoenix, um, I found out that there was a, a Halloween company in Phoenix called Imagineering. And Imagineering was the, the company that um, came up with, um, one second, let me grab it. Yeah. Sure. Oh my gosh, Guy I please. Oh, there it is, it's Imagineering. Uh, oh yeah, so there we go, Imagineering with, with the old vampire blood. And oh, this yeah, gentleman right here, yeah. you, you remember that stuff as a kid? You'd buy the Kmart sure. and stuff? Oh my God, yeah. Of course, yeah, and uh, and the, the plastic vampire teeth, you know, that you, you put them in your mouth and they'd cut the crap out of your gums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. I never. But anyways, but this, is, this is this gentleman here is the the wonderful uh, Larry Liff, um, who I love dearly. He's like a second dad to me, but he's the guy that invented vampire blood and the evil teeth and things like like the the oozing orb, which I'll mm. tell you a story about Guillermo del Toro and the and the oozing orb. But anyways, um, so when I was eighteen. Um, what had happened was in, um, when, during high school, I was still friends with a science teacher back in, in, uh, in Phoenix and uh, his name is Francis Reimprecht. And during high school, he had just gotten a student teacher and her name was Patricia and Patricia had, uh, just married Larry. And, um, so Francis was talking to Patricia and, and she said, I just married this gentleman. His name is Larry Liff and he owns a Halloween company in, in town. And Francis all of a sudden just thought of me because he knew how much I loved Halloween and monsters and all that stuff. And he said, um, uh, you know, one of my ex-students, you know, who's over at Kellenbach High School now, he's about to graduate. But, um, you know, he loves monsters and all that. And, you know, and maybe, you know, he can put together a portfolio to uh, to take the show to Larry. So she organized something and I went to go meet Larry. This was after I graduated from from high school. And uh, I'll never forget. Um, <laughs> it was in June. And uh, I went to go visit Larry, and Larry was on the uh, on the far west side of, of Phoenix on Sixtieth uh, Avenue, and it was in June. And I had a the car that I had was a, a, a car that my mom and dad bought me for a graduation present, but it was, it was an old uh, two door uh, Toyota Corolla, and, you know, with no air conditioning. And, yeah. and you don't want to be in Arizona in June. It's, no, it's, it was <laughs> hot, hot as hell. Anyways, I went I went there, and you know, I had to roll down the windows, but I wore my graduation suit was which was a, a sears uh tan polyester suit you know and so i look i look sharp i look good yeah, you know, yeah, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was so hot in that thing and i went to go meet larry and you know uh and we, we hit it off and larry said uh, well I'll, I'll give you a, a tour through the through the through the workshop and i'll never forget going through the through the, these double doors the doors opened up into this workshop and it was, I felt like Charlie from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, it's like, yeah. you know, because all these machines, there was a machine making the vampire blood and the oozing orb and all this stuff. And I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and Larry said, he says, look, you know, eventually I want to get into making some Halloween masks and stuff, but it's probably not going to be for another six months to a year. So I really don't have a job for you, you know, except for working out on the line. And I don't think you want to do that. That's pretty yeah. monotonous. And I said, oh, yes, I do. Yeah. So he said, well, if you really want to, like I said, it's going to be at least six months or so. And so I worked out on the line and the, and I, I got to make some of the vampire blood and and put stuff into the kits and everything to assemble all these these different makeup products. So I was out there for six months and, you know, every now and then I'd see Larry walking through the through the uh, through the uh, place out, out back there. And, you know, I'd wave to him. And say, I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> he would just shake his head. He said, all right. Yeah. And so six months later, he came out and got me. He says, well, look, you know. You've stuck it out six months, and so you know you must be determined. And uh, so you know, may I take a chance and uh, see what you can do? And so he gave me this little room, and uh, he said, "Well, you know how to how to sculpt and everything." I said, "Yeah," and I didn't, you know. So I just, uh, just you know do your thing where you just you, you make it work. And so I started playing around with some clay and sculpting some things, and um, just got to be more and more involved with the company. And and finally, we he wanted to set up a. Uh, a latex factory so that we could produce these masks. Um, so what he did is that he set up um, uh, for me to go to, to Los Angeles, to North Hollywood, to a company called Vic's Novelty. And uh, it was owned by Vic Provenzano. And, um, and, um, and so I was going to, so I was supposed to go to uh, North Hollywood and stay there for, um, I think it was for about four months, I think. And it was, uh, Vic was going to teach me how to, how to, you know, set up a, a latex factory and all everything that's, that's involved in, in making that. And, um, so the funny thing about Vic's novelty is that, um, uh, Vic 
himself was was a real character, and um, he almost he looked like um, who was the guy who uh, who did all the aerobics and everything. Um, Richard, you know, Richard Simmons. Richard Simmons. Yes, yeah. he looked like he reminded me of Richard Simmons. Um, but anyways, we were walking through to the factory, and they're, they're making all these molds and masks and everything. And then I was in heaven again, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the smell was really really strong of this hot melt vinyl. And I went to go, um, you know, going through these these big barrels, and because he, he made a lot of a uh, like the fake snakes and everything for that they sold to Disneyland and everything. Oh, and yeah. uh, and then I just you know I was picking up all these big snakes. He says, "Oh, you can take all you want and everything." But I happened to pick up this one big snake, which wasn't a snake. It was an adult novelty. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big one. <laughs> and, uh, and I just threw it down, and, and he laughed. He goes, oh, yeah, that's that's my other company that I have called Better Than Leather. <laughs> so, I'm going, oh, my God. You know, and here I was. I was, you know, I was maybe I was 19, I think. And then I looked over, and there was like a long bench that had all these, these you know, Mexican women that were grinding the seams off of these big things. <laughs> Something that stayed in my head that I'll never forget. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be here for four months, you know, with all this. And, um, oh my God. Anyways, so, and I, anyways, stayed there, learned a lot about the, the how to set up a factory and everything. And by then, Larry thought more about it and thought, well, you know, this is going to be too hard to set up here. I think we'd be better off to go to an existing, uh, uh, company and there was one in a place called Tecate, Mexico, oh, okay. which is about 30 30 miles on the border from San, uh, San Diego. And uh, Tecate is a place that makes an amazing beer called Tecate yeah, beer. I get yeah, that. And, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. But the cool thing about those bottles of beer is that on the on the bottom bottom of the of each uh, uh, bottle has an indentation, so you can get the other bottle, stick it in there, and twist it off to take off the cap. I always oh, thought that was really ingenious. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyways, but we went there and, and I would go there for about a year and I travel from Phoenix to fly into San Diego and then I would have a car there and I would drive into Tecate, stay there for the week, supervise the, 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 the mask uh, production and um, and then, you know, fly back. So I did that for like a year. And so I just got more and more involved with with the company, obviously. And and also what happened during this time was uh, every year Larry would have a, a huge photo shoot. Uh, to showcase all the new uh, products um, with all the makeup and the masks and things like that. And Dave Siegel, who's an amazing photographer, we went to a, go to his studios there in Phoenix um, and uh, and shoot all the stuff. Now, Larry had a, a really good friend. His name was Barry Coper. And Barry Coper was a, a makeup artist, really well, uh, uh, you know, settled down into, into Hollywood and worked at uh, CBS Studios as a head of makeup there for many years. Oh, wow. And, uh, and Barry would come into Phoenix and apply all these makeups and everything. And Barry and I got to be great friends. And, you know, Barry is like my big brother now and love him to death. And he took me under his wing and he says, you have to come out to L.A. and I'll, you know, show you around and let you, you know, introduce you to some of the, the, the big makeup guys and stuff. And wow. so I would do that. And the, the really ironic thing about this whole thing is it's really weird is that um, Barry was taught by John Chambers from Planet of the Apes. Oh, wow. oh no way. Full circle. Weird. Yeah, exactly. And that was just incredible. <laughs> And through uh, Barry, uh, he introduced me to John Chambers. So I got to meet John, which was really incredible. Wow. Um, and anyways, I would go out there and Barry would introduce me to the great makeups, you know, like like uh, Dick Smith, Rick Baker, uh, Stan oh, yeah. Winston, all these really incredible guys. And Dave Miller was another one of these great, great legends um, that I would eventually go go and work with. Now, Barry always kept telling me, he says, you've got to come move out here. You've got to come move out here and, you know, work in the industry. And I was just always like, oh, I don't know. I'm a bit worried about it. You know, I don't know if I'll get enough work. And. Is it so competitive? And, uh, and Wait, how old, and Gina, how old were you at this point? I just yeah, right. at this point, I think I was probably in my early twenties, maybe 21, 22. Okay. Wow. Okay. And, um, okay. and Barry would always keep bugging me about it. And, and the other reason why I didn't want to go is because, uh, uh, mom wasn't well, she was, she was pretty sick with cancer oh, okay. and I was always afraid that something was going to happen, uh, sure. to her, but mom was great. She was always really pushing me, you know, says, uh, look, you, you should really, you should really go. I said, look, if something's going to happen to me, it's going to happen to me while you're here, while you're there. It's, it's going to happen, you know. But you know, you should, you should take care, take advantage of this situation now, and do something. And it's like, yeah, I, I will. I will, you know, when when I'm ready, when I'm ready. And um, anyways, a time came where Barry had got me a job over at NBC Studios, working with the, the head of makeup there, whose name was Bob Scribner. And um, uh, Bob was had a, a show coming up called Friday Night Surprised. 
that was headed up by Dick Clark. You remember the Dick uh, Clark? Yeah, sure, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, American Bandstand. Oh, yeah. And the New Year's and, uh, Countdown. Yeah. Sure. The and um, New Year's Eve. He was, he was doing a doing a show called Friday Night Surprise, and a section of the show was a takeoff from an old parody that they used to do back in the '60s called The Masquerade, where they would have celebrities come on stage, the live stage, dressed up as other celebrities, you know, made up as other celebrities. Okay. And it was like it was an audience participation of of uh, of who they were through questions and that kind of stuff, and he had to guess who they were. Anyways, we did we did that little thing, but um, we did it with uh with uh, the the guys from uh, Gilligan's Island, uh, oh, Ellen right. Hale, Bob Denver, you know, Skipper and Gilligan. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. um, and this was incredible for me because I mean, I, I love Gilligan's Island. In fact, it was just on last weekend and I was trying to watch it. And my daughter's like, what are you watching this for? Dad, it's black and white. It's like, oh, this is the last <laughs> <laughs> I know this is the one where, where Gilligan gets his nose broken. It's just, it's so right. <laughs> and um, anyway, so, but I had to turn Alan Hale into WC Fields and turn Bob Denver into Mae West. So it, was oh, quite, it, wow. wasn't such a, it wasn't such a stretch for Alan Hale, but for, uh, yeah. uh, for uh, the other guy was for Bob. Was and um, anyways, they came in and it was uh, Alan Hale came in first and he was such a sweetheart. And it was just like my, my first time of, of really meeting like a real movie star. And a celebrity, I take, yeah. yeah. And I had to take his face cast. And and um, then Bob came in shortly after that. And it had been a while since they'd seen each other. And so, um, so the first thing that Alan said to Bob is this little buddy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my God. I can't hey, believe buddy. No way. I'm trying, trying to stay cool, you know. And uh, so, you know, Bob came in, sat on the chair and took his live cast. And then I, then I went to work, started sculpting the pieces. And um, so I would tell my mom, you know, I'd call her, you know, each day. And I said, look, I, you know, I, I met Alan Hale and Bob Denver and I'm sculpting the pieces and everything. <laughs> and it was a pretty quick job because it was going to be like a, I had like four days to make everything. And then we we're going to shoot the episode. And so the time came when I did the makeup, shot the episode and, um, and watched it. And I still had about a, uh, another four or five days left there in L.A. before I, I took a leave of absence from the, the Halloween company. And uh, mom was really proud. She's very excited about it all. And I said, I said, now, um, Dave Miller, who I'd mentioned before. Now, Dave Miller is an amazing makeup effects guy and probably best known for the work that he did on creating uh, the look of Freddy Krueger for the first oh, night. Wow. Right. wow. And um, burn, burn skin. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, by this time, uh, Dave was working on part five of Nightmare on Elm Street. And Dave said, he says, hey, how'd you like to? Come, come work with me, and you know, you know, help me sculpt and, and do some Freddy Krueger stuff. It's like, yeah. So, uh, so I did that, and I uh, was working with Dave, and and I would tell mom, you know, call her every night. I says, I'm working with Dave Miller on Freddy Krueger, and I'm doing this and that. And um, I said goodbye. Next day, I got a, uh, a friend of mine called me. A close friend said, "Look, I'm really sorry, but your mom passed away uh, last night." Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh, it was just devastating. So I had I rushed home. And yeah, she was gone. So it was very sad. And it was just one of those things where it's like, you know, there was really nothing holding me back anymore. And Larry was always trying to kick me out of the nest as well. It's like, yeah. I says, look, you've gone as far as you can here. I says, I, you know, you, you need to be over there. And so he kicked me out of the nest and I decided to pack up and move to LA. So I was in my early twenties and moved out there and I went back and finished working with Dave Miller and uh, worked with him on a couple other shows. And just kind of made my way around, you know, working at different shops and working with a great uh, artist like, you know, Rick Baker and and um, and lots of people like that. Wow. Wow. All right. I'm, I'm going to take a deep breath because that was an amazing story. I love hearing origin stories just in general. Just, but that that was just because knowing your body of work now and, and where you started it even more, it's even more exciting and, and, and meaningful. <laughs> When, when you go to a, a Stan Winston and a, and a Rick Baker at, at this point, and you're still pretty young, you're just kind of getting your, you know, cutting your teeth. Um, so what kind of, I guess, body of work do you have um, to be able to, to showcase them at this point? Or is it, or is it work ethic? Is it just like, I'm here, I'm going to do it, I've got a few things, or is it it's by that point you'd already made a bunch of things? Um, a little bit of both. I had made a lot of stuff because the great thing about working at Imagineering, which really opened up all these doors for me, you know, and meeting Barry and Larry, um, was that the little workshop that Larry gave me to work in, um, I would I would work, um, you know, from nine to five, normal job, and go home and I'd have dinner, and I'd drive back in the evenings at around seven and work till at least midnight or so. But that oh, was yeah. my time to create and just to yeah. do stuff. And so I was practicing my sculpting, practicing mold making, 
And I had this great book called uh, Bizarro by this uh, amazing makeup artist whose his name is uh, Tom Savini, who did like yeah, all the Friday right. the 13th oh, and yeah. Jason and all that kind of oh, stuff. He's a great guy. We've become great friends now, which is amazing. But uh, but in his his book Bizarro, it showed a lot of step by step stuff on how he actually uh, made a lot of things. And so I was following that. And one of the times I, I wanted to have a, a, a fake a fake arm, a fake cut off arm. And so I uh, I called my friend, uh, my good old redneck buddy Greg Etner. You know, I lived in Phoenix, and and Greg would do anything for beer. <laughs> so <laughs> sounds I know those people. I know those people. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, you know, I gave him a twelve pack. I said, hey, Greg, I want to, I need to make a a mold of your arm so I can make a fake, you know, uh, uh, latex one. And he says, says, yeah, all right. And so um, Greg came back with me to the shop one night, and I was going through the steps. You know how it said that you have to use clay to separate it in the, in the two halves, the top half and the bottom half. And so I was doing all these these steps and, you know, following everything. And and one of the things it said to do is that, you know, to use plenty of Vaseline on, on the arm to protect the hairs and everything. So I did yeah. that and I put put the first layer of plaster on there and that set up. That was fine. <laughs> Turn the arm over, you know, Vaseline that on and uh, put the plaster on there. And uh, then the plaster goes through a, a heat stage where it can get start getting yeah, it gets hot. hot. Yeah, yeah. So it starts steaming, and Gray's going. He says, "God damn, it's getting hot." I said, "Not supposed to. This is the heat stage. It'll be fine. It'll cool down in a minute." You know, trying to trying to fan it, and steam's coming up with it. Anyways, then, it, then the, the the plaster was was hard. You know, now it's time to take it off. So I took the underside off first, and it popped off beautifully, really nice. And I had like all the detail of his hand of his handprints and everything, and. Um, and then, uh, then it came, came time to take the top half off, and I went to go pull it, and he goes, "Oh!" oh. And I said, "What? What?" And he goes, "It's stuck." I said, "No, it's not stuck." He said, "No, my hairs." Said, no, it's not. I said, "I put Vaseline on there." He said, "Look, step three, right here, put plenty of Vaseline." I did. He says, "I don't care. It's stuck." And I pulled it up a little bit, and I looked inside, and all the hairs like stuck like this in the plastic, <laughs> and because he was he was quite hairy at the, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so the wow. And so I, I, I pulled it up a little bit and I got a little uh, scalpel knife and I was just trying to go like, bing, 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 trying to cut the hair. And he goes, he goes, oh, just pull it. I'm going, what? Said, just pull it. And I said, all right. And he goes, hang on a minute. And he gets his beard. <laughs> <calls it down. laughs> just, Do it. And uh, you know that sound that Velcro makes? Oh, <laughs> God. Good Lord. And he yeah. screamed. And but on the inside of the arm, I had this beautiful carpet of this hair on the inside of the mold <laughs> uh, anyways the, it looked amazing i put the mold back together poured latex into it and then some polyfoam and when i demolded the whole thing uh, it came out amazing because all the hair is stuck in the latex oh. so i had this this amazing arm with all this perfectly you know groomed hair into it human hair yeah that is yeah. awesome so that, that was that was the last time that greg uh, you know came down and let me be his, his, his for the <laughs> big guinea pig and, that, and that's how waxing was invented. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question, so I, I would do a lot of stuff like that, you know, making my own sculptures um, and, and you know, photographing them and putting together a portfolio because, you know, that, that even to, to this day, that's the most important thing you can do is to really to put together a really good portfolio to show that you're yeah. well-rounded, yeah. that you, you can sculpt, mold, cast, paint, you know, rather yeah. than just doing, focusing on one thing. Um, so I did have a pretty decent portfolio of that. And that's the one thing that really, you know, got me into a lot of the shops. And, uh, and from there, just working on at the shops was amazing. Just working with these great artists and seeing their techniques on how they do stuff and just all that kind of stuff. And I was just like a sponge, just sucking all this information and then just becoming a better and better artist. Wow. Amazing. Wow. So, so how did you get into entertainment and, uh, and made that transition to, other projects for television movies and stuff like that well, i guess the transition happened just you know working with um with dave miller was the first film that i'd worked on and then um i think after that um i met a friend of mine his name is mitch coughlin who was working with dave miller and um mitch had finished with dave's and had gone over to work with a company called adi called amalgamated dynamics incorporated owned by alec gillis and tom woodruff two really amazing and really talented artists um, who used to work at Stan Winston's, kind of where they where they got their kind of earlier start. And um, anyways, they had this great company, but they had a uh, the first show on their own was a, a movie called Tremors. Do you remember Tremors? Oh, yeah. love I love that movie. Yeah. I great saw it in the movie. theater. I love that movie. Yeah. And um, and uh, with uh, Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Yeah. And uh, and 
and he and he told me so i'm working at, at adi and we're working on the show called tremors with these giant worms and he showed me a picture i thought holy shit, that's amazing and um anyways um so a lot of time had passed and and they had another show that they were doing which was point break and so yeah. so mitch yeah. had told alec and tom about me and my mask making background all that kind of stuff so i had an interview with alec and tom and because in Point Break, we had to, they had to make the uh, president masks. President. And oh, so I was, I was hired for that just because of my background of, of doing the, 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 the Halloween masks and things. And that was my start with ADI. And from there, it, it was just, you know, escalated to we went to go work on Alien 3, Death Becomes Her, Wolf, and uh, uh, Demolition Man. Just really wow. some really, really incredible shows. You know, that's one movie, Death Becomes Her, is... is <laughs> I love that movie, and when I saw that you had done that movie, it's like Jesus, he's done everything that I like. <laughs> I, good. Look, that I mean, Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep. Yeah, and yeah. so this is about the time also when when CG was starting to kind of creep in, and you know, and, and getting pretty good with some stuff. Um, but um, Robert Zemeckis, the director, wanted to have some physical, you know, uh, puppets as well. And so this is um, at the bottom there, the row there, you can see there, that's that's the puppet that we did of Meryl Streep, uh, mm -hmm. fully articulated and, uh, and mechanized, you know, blinked, you know, and she had lip sync because she had to uh, lip, lip sync some lines as well. And, oh, wow. uh, and also the, the material is something that's really interesting is because a lot of the times we would use a material called foam rubber, foam latex, which is um, something like, you know, the makeup sponges that, you know, uh, women use to put on their makeup, you know. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but it's it's very soft, spongy, and, and, and it's breathable. But that's that's the way that, you know, the Plan B Apes uh, prosthetics were, were made out of this material. But the, the problem, not so much a problem, but the, the, the uh, one of the things with, um, with uh, this material is that it's very opaque. And so to get it to look very fleshy and, and uh, lifelike, it requires a great deal of skill to paint it but also how it's lit is very important as well. Um, but then this material came out, uh, silicone came out and silicone is an amazing material. It's, it's used, you know, been used for making molds and everything, but this company um, came out with this uh, very translucent uh, material, which was, it wasn't quite water clear. Um, it was a, a, not as opaque as milk, but it was a uh, very translucent and you could add pigment into that to make it fleshy or whatever color you oh. wanted. So, we started playing around with that just because it's it's so translucent like our skin because like with our skin light actually you know absorbs into our skin because of the translucency mm -hmm. and you know and, and 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 bounces around whereas a foam rubber light hits it and just bounces off of it um but the problem with it with this material is that like with silicone nothing sticks to silicone except silicone right. and so trying to come up with a paint system that would work that wouldn't rub off was a real tricky thing so that was my job to try to create a paint system for this. And I came up with a technique of using uh, uh, acrylics and to airbrush. And airbrushing was one of my specialties in doing and painting a lot of these masks and makeups and stuff. Um, and so I would uh, paint it with uh, uh, with all these acrylics, build up a lot of these washes, and it just made it look really translucent, just really skin-like, you know, by adding the freckles, uh, the, the veins and, and capillaries and all that kind of stuff on there. And I would build up, you know, probably a good, you know, 10 to 12 different layers of these colors. And then on the, the, for, for the final coat, I found that there was this adhesive, a silicone adhesive that I would uh, thin down with, uh, with a nasty chemical material called methylene chloride. And yeah. so, and, uh, and the, uh, the adhesive was in, in, in a caulking tube, just like silicone caulking. But I would thin that down to like the consistency of a little bit thinner than milk. And this material was very clear and translucent, and I would spray it through a big gun over the top of my over the top of my paint job. And what it would do is because the uh, the uh, methylene chloride was so aggressive that it would it would take the adhesive and it would bite through my layers of paint and go to the to the layers underneath there and bond itself to the uh, to the base silicone. And wow. so it was like a, a sealant over the very top of it. And once it cured, it was great because the paint would stick on there and it wouldn't rub off or anything. So. Um, that really put us on the map um, for using this material and how it made everything just look so much more realistic. Yeah. And uh, so Death Becomes Her, I think we were the first studio uh, to ever use this material and uh, to use it on this uh, on, on this film, on Death Becomes Her. Yeah, wow. it was impressive, man. Yeah, I remember just being blown away by it. Mm. It, made the, it put the movie over the top for me, too, because it was a comedy and it had all <laughs> this crazy visual effects. Yeah. yeah. 
and that was ILM that did the visual effects. And um, uh, in fact, uh, we all won the Oscar that year for that. Uh, it was split between uh, ILM and um, and Alec and Tom had to had to flip a coin for it. And uh, Tom oh, wow. Tom won the, the flip and the, and got got to go up on stage and you know thank us all and everything, which was oh, great. Wow. But it was a great great um, just great th great way to use both you know digital and practical together. You know, and it worked mm -hmm. really really well. Yeah, that's, yeah that's especially when digital was in its infancy, like it was at that point, or very young, and and kind of getting kind of getting its legs, and then kind of flash forward to to Weta when you're there and you're the uh, digital, you were the texture, you, you so so clearly you know you know through all of this trial and error and physical form, you're you're getting the texture. I my question is when when you get to be on, you get to work on all of those movies that Mickey mentioned at the beginning. And you know, just the, the, your IMDb is just like, wait, what? That it, it just blows your mind. But from a texture perspective, when it becomes digital, um, are you? And I know it's a, the physical beings primarily, as opposed to like you're working on trees and trying to get grass right or something like that. But when it comes to that, that um, does does all of that uh, um, path you went on from the time you were at the Halloween store to 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 when you were in, in LA? help you in a lot of ways when you become the digital texture guy at Weta. I mean, is that, is that, does it culminate well, or does it now you have to translate it into, into digital? Is it, is it, is there a big disconnect there? No, absolutely. And, and all that stuff helped me so much. <clears throat> I'm just learning how to airbrush and, you know, mm -hmm. layer all my layers together um, and building up those layers, you know, so that it just looks really realistic. And it's an interesting one of, of how I got to be over at, at Weta Digital is um, uh, Joe Letary, who runs uh, What a Digital. Um, and this was while we were still doing, I think it must have been film two, so the two towers of Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we had just finished doing a, a fake body of Boromir, uh, the actor Sean Bean, uh, yeah. after, after he gets uh, killed um, by uh, Lurtz. Oops, spoiler, sorry. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it by now, I mean, come on. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we had to do this, this uh, fake body of, of Sean, which uh, which came out looking great. I mean, it was a great uh, uh, compilation and great team of all these different artists, you know, working together at what a workshop. And then I would, I would, I did the painting on it, and uh, we had you know special people come in to, to do the hair work on it and everything, and you know, the sculpting molding. But it was, it's one of my favorite pieces that we've done, I think, because it looks so realistic. And I was, anyways, I was finishing doing the finishing touches. And Joe, this is the day that Joe Terry had to come through the workshop just to check out all the stuff we were doing because it was so amazing. The, the workshop was just so full. We had like over 300 people in, in the workshop, you know, all these different departments doing the armor, you know, makeup and, and all sorts of stuff. And Joe came in and, um, and I had uh, a Boromir on the ground there. And he says, wow, this looks pretty cool. He says, it looks, looks, looks real. And I said, oh, thanks. I said, you know, it's just, we've, just, we've just finished it. We've been working on it for a couple of weeks now. And, um, and and Joe said, he says, wow, says, you know, the, the skin on this just looks so realistic. There's so much depth to it. You know, I can see the veins and the capillaries and stuff and, you know, and the little, you know, little minuscule things of freckles and everything. I said, so I said, how did you, how did you do this? And I said, well, to start out with, it's, it's the, it's the, um, the silicone itself, you know, it's just, again, starting with the translucent material and I'm building up all my layers of the, 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 you know, the, the, the veins and the capillaries and the freckles and, and all sorts of modeling and everything, you know, to, to make it look realistic. And, uh, and, um, and he said, he says, well, you know, um, you know, the, the little Gollum bust that you did, and I painted this, this bust of Gollum um, for, uh, for Peter Jackson and, and the team to buy off on the colors. We did, I did like three different uh, color schemes and he bought off on this one particular one. And so this one particular one went over to Weta Digital uh, for them to copy, you know, to, to paint onto the digital uh, uh, golem, and yeah. Joe said, "Well, that that little bus that you painted, um, the texture artists are just kind of having a hard time trying to mimic what you've done on that. And now that you've just explained to me your process and everything, that just, you know, a light bulb just went off in my head. And and, and he said, he says, you know, how would you like to learn some texture painting? And I said, well, uh, does, it involve, does it involve a computer? And he goes, yeah. And I said, no. a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, I said, uh, no, Joe. I said, look, I. Like I just barely got email. I'm struggling with that. I'm, just, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm technically challenged. Even to this day, I am. Um, and Joe says, "Oh, come on, look. Well, we'll at this time, what a workshop and what a digital. We're literally two buildings back to back, and and they still are to this day." And he says, "Look, you won't. You don't even 
to leave your office. I said, well, come set up a computer in your office and we'll have a guy um, who is a texture uh, painter come and teach you the basics and everything. And maybe as a trade, maybe what you can do is that maybe you can tra train him on how you physically airbrush. And it was like, uh I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and Richard Taylor was there with me, and Richard's going to say, Oh, come on, mate, do it, try it. And it's like, oh, mate. All right. And um, so I did it. And so, anyways, they came over and set me up with this computer in my office. And uh, they had a texture artist whose name was uh, Sodegay, Sodegay Neshupov, you know, a Russian guy. And uh, he's still there with us. He's, he's a great friend and uh, incredibly talented. And Sodegay, at the time, he had just kind of started at Weta. And so his English wasn't so great. And so I'm going great. So this guy who doesn't speak good English is gonna gonna be teaching me all this technical stuff. And so <laughs> yeah. just, anyways, we went through this whole uh, whole thing, and uh, I, I finally learned a lot of the basics. And and it was pretty interesting, you know, at first because I think at first the biggest challenge was painting on on a Wacom tablet. Now a Wacom tablet is a, is a tablet that sits on the on the on the table, but then you have the screen up here, so you have to get the hand eye coordination. Right, because you're oh, drawing okay. on the table. Yeah. But actually, the cursor's up here, and uh, so that was a bit weird. But um, you know, it didn't take too long to get used to that. And anyways, the way that I, I took this on, I, I thought, okay, I'm just going to pretend that this digital head of Gollum that I could turn in the computer, and um, you know, I could make up my my color palette and everything of all the colors I want, and um, I'm just going to paint it like I normally do. You know, I start out with little squiggly lines with the reds and everything, and yeah. and the browns and the veins and everything, and um, and then from what I understood is that there was another team of artists called the shaders. Now, the shader department were these magicians that could make that skin look, you know, really translucent or really dry or all, all sorts of stuff. So I was just thinking, well, once I hand over the, the paint job to them, then they can do their magic on it. And that's kind of the way it all started with uh, um, with how Gollum was painted. So it was painted by Sergei and myself. And um, that kind of got gave me my start over at What a Digital. And at wow. the time, they didn't really have a, a, a creature guy, per se, uh, to art direct the creatures and things. And so I became kind of the liaison between what a workshop and what a digital uh, for that. So I would work kind of part time between the two, as well as then, you know, having to go on set to apply makeups and stuff. So it was, it was a busy few years. Uh, but, uh, I got more and more involved with what a digital and just really found it all really fascinating. And once I started learning more and more about the uh, the process of how everything is done, it just and also I started to see kind of the writing on the wall on how things are going to be changing in the next few years. You know, and unfortunately with, um, uh, you know, probably being less practical stuff and more digital. And a lot of this stuff happened as well, because when Jurassic Park came out, the first one, you know, yeah. everybody, all my friends working in the practical side just flipped out, including myself. It's like, oh, crap, look at that. I mean, that's you can't beat it. I mean, the digital stuff looks so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this was another great, uh, great way that they use practical and digital because Stan Winston Studio made these full size, incredible animatronic dinosaurs as well. Oh yeah, I, I think I think I've heard that there's actually more screen time from the practical uh, dinosaurs on, on screen than there is digital. But anyways, okay. but the way, the way that the two blended together was just beautiful, perfect. Yeah. You know? And um, so mm -hmm. that was kind of my start of getting started over at, at what a uh, what a digital doing more of that stuff. But to go back to your original question um, was yes, learning all that stuff back when I was training myself on how to paint and, and how to mimic skin and everything taught me a lot of, especially when I was painting that golem head. Yeah. Well, the the, the 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 part of the movie I think it was Twin Towers when he when they're when um, Frodo and Sam are kind of dragging uh, Gollum around like the Smeagol, I guess he's at that point. And, and even to the same, I think that was 2004 or five, something like that, if I remember right, maybe, maybe earlier, but, but even to this day, when you watch it, there's a little subtle things you can see that are, you know, you know, from a, from an acting perspective, they don't, they, maybe the eye isn't perfectly on them or something, but from a digital perspective, it's just mind boggling as to how you, you know, they're, they're working with this subject that isn't there at all. Um, and, you know, or, or maybe an actor in a, in a costume or something like that at that point, because I know, uh, Andy and, Sturgis, and Sturgis. yeah, he sort of did that. And, and so, but it just, it just my, it, so, so that from in the skin, like you mentioned that the team that does like the skin texture and like the, if they want to make it look dry or, or, you know, wet or, or whatever it is, um, all of that stuff. So, so you're directing that entire team at this point, right. For, for those movies. I did. Yeah, I looked after the textures department for about seven years, which was a lot of fun. And it was um, 
Um, it was back in the days when we didn't have so many as, as many shows as we have on now. Um, yeah. But one, one of the biggest shows that we, we did, I mean, besides Lord of the Rings and we got into Avatar, Avatar was a huge show. Yeah. And I think I looked after about 50 texture artists wow. and, um, you know, doing doing art direction with them and helping them and doing paint overs um, to show them, you know, some suggestions on maybe how this color could work and how this this modeling, you know, pattern could go on this kind of creature and stuff. I heard there's going to be there's going to be more a lot more um, Avatar coming out. Are you are you part of any of those newer? Because I, I yeah I guess it's just it's been a long time since the last one was out. But I've I've heard through the grapevine or whatever internet that there's going to be a bunch more coming out. Right? Is that is yeah that yeah they're they're coming. Yep, they're they're going to, they're going to be amazing. Awesome, awesome. Now are you, are you part of this? I mean, should we uh, we can't divulge anything? If you, you know, you can't divulge it. But are you? No, we 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 are involved. That's about all I can say. Okay, there we go. Right. I can't wait. I can't wait. So more magic. It's gonna be oh. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but to go back again, just with the with the golem stuff is like all that stuff with um, uh, Sam and Frodo, you know, dragging Gollum through. That was all done with with Andy Circus. Okay. And so that was uh, you know uh, Andy. He was called it was called a gimp suit. We put him in this like a onesie kind of a um, you know a suit. That we painted green and. Um, and so they had to actually, uh, in, in rotoscoping, they had to paint them out and replace them with the digital. Uh, oh digital. So it was great. And all that kind of stuff is great just because it's like the actors have somebody to actually react with and to look yeah. at, you know, yeah. as opposed to the old, you know, tennis ball kind of thing. Yeah. So I remember there's one, and sorry, Paul, I know you guys have a million things too, but there's one part where, that I've seen, I think it was a, right after it was made and every, the world was on, you know, J.R. Tolkien fire and, and could, couldn't get enough of it. And there was a, Andy Circus, uh, I don't know if it was a video clip or what, but it was showed him as Gollum in that suit, flipping down a river trying to catch that fish. If you remember, mm -hmm. and and I was just like blown away by the dedication he had to for that character that he knew that would be you know completely CG'd out, but they, they knew it was him. But I mean, he was flipping, flopping all over the all over the ground and probably getting injured, you know, uh, as he was going. But the, it was it was remarkable, and it was just like. Yeah, I knew that that thing was just going to be a mind blower when it came out. Oh yeah, that was that was really incredible. Um, and I think I remember on that that day was it, it was freezing. There was actually snow all around there, but they had to get these big uh, heater things and melt all the snow just to keep oh the my continuity. Melt all the <laughs> so that water was ice, ice cold. Oh my god! It probably helped all, all, helped all the bruising on on Andy's knees and, <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Oh, uh, these pictures are insane. This is, I mean, th I these are like part of me. I mean, like these, my kids, we've watched every one of these so many times. And it's just like, I, to be able to, you know, to talk with you who are there and, and part of this is just, anyway, I'm, no, I'm gushing. Sorry, 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 Gino, I'm gushing. Nah, <laughs> oh, this is great. And brings back a lot of memories. And these are some of my great friends here. Just the, on the, the small picture there on the left is a, a great makeup artist. Her name is Dominique Till. Uh, who lives in Los Angeles now, and um, there was myself, obviously, and then uh, and Marjorie Hamlin was the other. So we were the uh, three of the uh, prosthetic supervisors on on the on the show, and then of course the the two wizards there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think shortly after, that, shortly after the shot, they they jumped into a, a little golf cart and they took off driving <laughs> driving, driving around the set. Yeah, very, very Middle Earth like. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, um, I mean, these. Is so outstanding so uh, yeah this is just with andy with um as his transformation into, into smeagol and yeah. so of course here he's got some some uh gelatin uh hobbit ears and uh so, so again talking about materials um we didn't have the silicone materials um for to make the prosthetics as we do today um so we used a lot of gelatin and even back on uh, ian mckellen and on christopher lee they, they're wearing uh, gel gelatin noses um, oh. For Ian McKellen, Ian McKellen was never meant to wear a nose, but once they they had the the wig and the beard and the mustache on him, his face just kind of diminished a bit. So they yeah, needed to bring cool. out bring out the nose a little bit. So it's a very subtle piece sculpted by uh, Mike Asquith at what a workshop did an amazing job on it. And and um, you know and uh, I started out applying it in the beginning, then had to turn it over to to some other artists, you know, to do it. And it's great because a lot a lot of people just don't realize that, that they're wearing prosthetic noses, which is great because we don't want them yeah. to know. Right. You know? But at the same time, I had no idea until now. Yeah. That's insane. At the same yeah. time, it's like, oh, you didn't notice my work. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could you have ever imagined when you were working on this at the time that it would be this iconic 
And I talked about um, before, like, for instance, I never would have imagined in 1977 that people in 2022, kids, would be walking around with Star Wars shirts. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So working in this, I said, like, Lord of the Rings is one of those uh, that probably has a, a shelf life like Star Wars. Oh, yeah. And if I, I be so, there in yeah. 40 years, could you have ever imagined that it would be like that when you were working on this? No, it's really funny because it's, you know, we get that question asked a lot. And it's like, you know, I've asked that question too of people that worked on Star Wars and things. And said, you know, did you know? And it's like, you know, you, you don't really. It's like, you know, you know it's going to be something special. And um, I just remember, you know, obviously being there on set and watching them film things. And um, one of the particular scenes was uh, when Boromir um, gets killed, you know, a shot, you know, a spoiler. Uh, but I, as I mentioned before, but it's, um, and of course, the act, amazing actor Sean Bean, and of course, uh, 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 Viggo Mortensen, you know, yeah. were there doing doing their bit, and we were all standing behind the cameras and stuff, and we were just, you know, tears are flowing down our eyes. It was so emotional, yeah. and um, and then Pete let us see a quick cut of the whole thing put together with music, and he put the uh, a Braveheart music to it, and then oh. we were all in the cinema just bawling our eyes out. It's like, oh my God! It's like. Uh, I just, you know, looking you see that even the hairs on my arms are standing up again because I just I'll never forget that. It was wow. really incredible. But um, yeah, we just did so many of those amazing uh, memories of of, uh, of being on set, and and I think we knew it was going to be something special, and uh, uh, and it was frustrating because we still had so long before the film was going to come out, but we couldn't say anything about it, you know. And, how, how long was that wait? You know, how long from the time you? You did that shot and and uh, to, to when you actually came out when, how long was that a year i think I, I came out in in 98 i think it was and so we had about a year and a half i think a year and a half uh possibly two years of, of making making a lot of the stuff before we started wow. filming and so oh. and and at this time it wasn't um you know at, at first i came out for uh, i was still working with uh, my friend patrick Topolis on godzilla and I remember taking a leave of absence for three months to come out to work on 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 this show, um, hmm. but we didn't talk about that. How we all that all happened, but anyways, I came out and um, then I had to go back to LA again. Then I came out again, and then I think at that that point I realized that this is going to be something pretty special, and um, that uh, you know I should just you know pack up and move here. And so I just remember <laughs> sending that 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 you know blank email out to everybody. Uh, saying I said look I've decided I'm gonna pack up and, and move to uh move to New Zealand and so wow. everybody wrote back he says he says are you drunk I said well yeah but yeah, <laughs> I made a really great decision I've got some I think this is gonna be pretty special and uh again you know I couldn't say anything to anybody except it's gonna be really cool and then finally when the first film came out and everybody saw it you know back in LA you know that's back in the days when I had a had a, a phone recorder machine mm -hmm. And I came, I came home one night and, and it was, it was filled up with like, you know, I think a hundred messages on there and uh, people were saying, Oh my God. I said, that was the most amazing thing I think I've ever seen. Yeah. And, um, and it was, uh, I remember my brother, my brother Dino, who's in Phoenix and I think he's watching Dino. And Dino. Uh, but he said, he said, he said uh, well, that was the worst ending to a film I've ever seen. I said, well, there's two more coming. He said, oh, <laughs> you have to, have to wait, to wait two years, but they'll be coming. Yeah. Oh. Amazing. Oh, wow. So, so, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. It, there's just so much stuff to cover. It's like my uh, my ADD is racing. I just keep jumping from movie to movie to movie that he's done. So you do you do the Lord of the Rings movies, and and then you move on to the Planet of the Apes movies, which, in my opinion, might be the very best visual stuff I've ever seen. To like the jump that they made technologically was crazy. I, well, that's actually what we did is we moved from uh, from Lord of the Rings and we did King Kong. King Kong, Skull Island was that Skull, Skull Island? Island. Uh, well, not that Skull Island. No, the um, um, it's uh, the the one with uh, um, Naomi Watts. Naomi Watts, that's right. Peter, okay. Peter Jackson's. Yeah, yeah, Peter okay, Jackson's okay. That's right. that's and that was that was incredible because again, um, you know, being such a huge apes fan, but of course a King Kong fan. <laughs> To be able to work on a King Kong movie, and, and especially with the Peter's vision of it, and his story was just incredible. Yeah, um, that was a uh, pr pretty amazing. And uh, and the, the great thing about that show too is like you know not 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 only with all the characters and creatures, but the uh, the natives 
Uh, so it was such a great time because Domini and myself had a great time where we had, uh, you know, a good few weeks where we could, we could design a lot of these uh, looks uh, for, for the natives. And Domini yeah. came up with a lot of really cool piercings and stuff that we put on, on these uh, actors that we had come in and did some really, really cool photo shoots and uh, uh, just crazy times. And when we actually shot to the natives on, on set um, at, the, at the Great Wall, um, it was it was it was raining and it, it was cold, and of course all these natives are, are pretty scantily clothed. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they're in body uh, paint, pretty much. Yeah, at this point, they were body painted as well. You know, to, to give them uh, even a deeper, darker kind of a of a, of a skin tone look. And Dominique came up with this really great, um, uh, like a, like a tattoo ink, not the real tattoo ink, but we call it this in the makeup field. It's a tattoo yeah. ink and that we could that we could spray through it. And what she did is that she had mixed in some. Uh, almost like a like a pearlescent kind of powder into it so once it was sprayed on the skin and dried you could actually buff the skin a little bit to give it a, another kind of a sheen to it oh it really cool so um but um but yeah but then you know moving on to the planet of the apes you know talking about going full circle of, of just you know loving the original planet <laughs> of the apes and to be part of the uh of the of the new planet of the apes was really incredible and so yeah. to, to i was able to the table i was able to bring a lot of my uh, my reference that I've collected, you know, over the years, including uh, life cast and, and of, of hands and feet and and all sorts of stuff uh, that I brought that we scanned and, and uh, that, that are used in the film. Oh wow! So I got to ask you this question. So you, you, I know there's other big movies probably that we can't talk about that are coming out of Weta that are just like everyone's just chopping, waiting to see what comes out next. But especially with Peter Jackson and, and your involvement. When it comes to bucket list things, you talked about um, you talked about the things you did with Planet of the Apes. You talked about, you know, of course, Lord of the Rings. Is there something on your list of monster movies or Godzilla? You know, all those things is that you haven't touched yet that you really want to do. It's like you're you're back in your mind. It's a project that you want to tackle someday that you, you've never gotten to yet. Uh, well, I mean, I would have loved to work on a Star Wars movie. You know, because uh, Star Wars for me as a kid was just you know another one that just blew my mind. You know, as yeah. you can see in the background there, I've got a couple of uh, props of some Star Wars stuff. But I saw that in uh, what was it? I think it was seventy-seven. I think or seventy-eight. I think that, did, that was did the year. That I, did you, dumb question. Did you see it at Cine Capri? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's where I saw it. That was you. That was you. I was with you. You're sitting, you're sitting in front of me, and I couldn't see past your head. That's right. That's, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's because, that's because he's six six. Yeah. Oh god. Well, yeah. the original yeah. and Empire at <laughs> Cine Capri, right? Yeah, I yeah, saw Empire Strikes Back there. I went there. with my friend uh, Jeff Keeney, and uh, we went there. Oh, and um, me being, I'm usually late, so we got there late. And when we walked into the cinema, it was already the the part where R two and C three P are going through the valley. Yes. Okay. Going, I, yeah. And I knew nothing about Star Wars, what it was about, or anything. <clears throat> and I thought, I said, oh, cool, it's got robots. And then, of course, the Jawas pop out. We sit down and Jawas pop out, and then we watch the rest of the movie, and it's just like, oh, my God. And this is back in the days when, after the movie was finished, you could you could still stay and watch it again if you wanted to. Right. Ah, so it did. So I saw the, you know, saw the whole prologue of everything that happened, and then it said, oh, now it makes sense of what, what, yeah. what happened. But, that, yeah, but then when the Tusken Raiders came out, your mind must have been blown. <laughs> Again, you know, yeah. like that, it's like Wee! amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it would have yeah, been so, great to be part part of that whole thing. Uh, oh my god, yeah. I love that. So Paul, in, in Phoenix, there was in, in uh, 24th Street, Calum back. There's this big theater that's no longer there called the Cine Capri, and it was a one screen theater. And if you wanted to watch um, Star Wars back then, you waited in line. I remember being a little kid, but you waited in line. During the, the beginning of the movie that was shooting before it, and you just sat there and you waited until that one came on, right? I mean, you like it's you stand out in the sun, basically <laughs> for yeah. for two hours. No other option, to, right? Yeah, to get tickets to get inside where it's air conditioned and there's popcorn. So, and the big That's deal of that cool. one was because it was curved. It was it was it was round, so you got to get this like really great and then had a great sound. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the last movie that I saw there was Days of Thunder. And it was all it's not because I wanted to see that movie. It was just because of the sound and how um, and just just the aesthetics of being in that theater. It was uh, really amazing. And uh, I got to see uh, Alien there. And that was, that oh. was pretty incredible. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, speaking, saw, saw, speaking of Alien. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, this is, this is my little buddy. 
So this is the um, the the, the spitting <laughs> alien from Alien Three, and uh, there I am with my coiffed hair and lots of hairspray. Glorious, <laughs> so yeah. glorious. This is about 1990, 1990, 1991, I think, and we're at uh, Pinewood Studios, and um, and uh, I was there with uh, Alec and Gillis and Tom Woodruff from ADI, along with uh, Mitch Coughlin, who I mentioned before. We had Dave Anderson, and uh, there's Alec and Tom, oh. and uh, it was just a. Uh, Oh, it was such an incredible experience to be, you know, for one, to be working on an alien film. And uh, Dave Fincher was the director on this one on Alien 3. And um, to be working on an alien film and to to be at, at Pinewood Studios. And when we went there, they still had a lot of the sets up still of uh, from Batman, the original Batman. Oh. <clears throat> and um, uh, anyways, they had like the, the, the long street and everything that was still there. Um, then we had the 007 stage where they shot uh, a lot of the, obviously a lot of the James Bond movies. And that's, that's, that was one of the big uh, uh, stages that we used. And the, the set builders over in London are just absolutely amazing. You know, the detail that they put into everything and um, the look of everything was just really super incredible. Um, but we were there for, I think, probably about eight or nine months, I think. It was only supposed to be six mm -hmm. months, but then it went on and on. And then we ended up coming back to L.A., and filming some more pickup shots where you know some things changed quite a bit um but yeah really really that was that was one that to take off tick off the bucket list of that to work on an alien film yeah holy so, crap there's some more of that uh, there i am this is after i painted one of the heads and um, i'm i think i'm gluing the uh neck piece onto there and tom woodruff was actually in the uh in the suit himself and uh his his vision was actually through the neck of the of the alien itself because the, because the, the head protruded out so far yeah and so the mouth and everything was all uh done with uh, cable controls and, and the lip action that's amazing what, what are you listening to on your walkman there actually yeah. on his air those look like airpods they look like the, <laughs> the old walkman i think it's no. barbara streisand no <laughs> <laughs> uh I, you know i've got i still have such an eclectic taste of music i listen to just about everything um but I was probably even listening to some old country music here, you know, thinking about Arizona. There nice. you go. <laughs> really? What, what did you, uh, so, so just a random question. Oh my God, I love that picture. When it comes That's, to like um, the day, in your opinion, that that um, that digital came in and practical, I mean, I, we watched recently uh, um, The Thing and my kids love the movie, The Thing, anything John, John Carpenter, but I'll, but, but like there's things and there's 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 practical effects that are still just so amazing and magical and like uh, you know Paul and I are, are a huge Rick Baker nuts and we love American Wealth in London and, and all of that practical stuff. What was your like opinion of like the the first movie or the first um, event where it blurred it effectively, um, digital and practical? I mean, in, in a positive way or negative? Well, of course, it's probably, probably probably negatives, but. Um, I guess positive way because there's probably earlier vision. <laughs> yeah, maybe both. Tell me both. Yeah, well, I think probably in a negative way, I was really disappointed um, with the movie that we did called Species, and okay. uh, did that with Steve Johnson's X Effects, and um, and Species was a uh, an HR Giger design. So once again, I'm a huge Giger design uh, uh, fan, and um, and and the puppets that were made at, at Steve's place were just really incredible, and then towards the end of the film. Um, it cuts to a, a CG version of it, and it was just like, oh no! Oh, it's just it's, okay. it's one of those things where it was like it's still in its infancy, but it's like it's it had the problems of, of weightlessness. It didn't have the weight to it. Oh, right. it ran too fast, and um, just didn't didn't quite work. Yeah. Was but, that um, with uh, Rebecca Romaine Stamos? Mm, no, I don't think so. No, it had N Nastasha Henstridge. Oh, That's okay. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca Romaine was in. Like there was a TV Ooh. version of it, wasn't there? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I literally yeah, thinking of the the prettiest blonde <laughs> women in the world is what I was doing. Wasn't she in Cat People? Nastasha Henstridge? Or no, that's another one. That's uh, that was, it was before another Russian that. beautiful girl. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Never mind. Um, but I mean, other shows that I think that that have uh, blended the two together are, you know, as I mentioned earlier with with um, uh, Jurassic Park. You know, that yeah. was the first yeah. one. Was some was really really great stuff. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. That's. That's the first time I remember seeing it. Okay. I think Jurassic Park was the first one that I was all in on 100%. When you first saw the dinosaurs and that scene in the field where the brontosaurus or whatever oh, they yeah. were, 
Yeah. That was like breathtaking. Yeah, that's 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 when you knew it was there to stay, right? Yeah, that had to be the moment. Yeah, no, totally. And it's like it's just you know it looks so good, and that's when everybody started, you know, who does this stuff practically, and just you know they're crapping themselves like, oh, shit, that's <laughs> like, like oh, great with my industry. Yeah, yeah they, well, they, they we all thought it was it had to be so easily to push D for dinosaur, as they they say, <laughs> and then they have a dinosaur, but it's not that at all. There's yeah. there's a huge amount of work, obviously, to. Uh, to get it to look right and to look good, you know, and Planet of the Apes was was a great example of that. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing just with the whole technology, how from film one to film three, how the last Planet of the Apes, uh, the technology just really changed the whole look of, of how the skin looks and, um, you know, with, with uh, different kind of sh the shaders that they had on the eyes and the fur. And, yeah. um, and also also just with the articulation of, of, uh, of the facial yeah, a system that they had was just you know really incredible uh yeah. I, I, I watch it today still and i just i'm just blown away by the work that you know, all the amazing team at, at what a digital have done i'm also i'm also sure that time and money are huge factors in this i mean they don't shoot anything on location anymore they'll put it on a on a, on a green screen set and build it i remember when they uh because I, I live in los angeles like um like when I was living in the valley, like Sherman Oaks area, there's a big kind of reservoir where they had, um, they basically made it a whole green screen set. And that's where they filmed like uh, one of the Transformers. And it was like right. this whole huge, it was, it was literally like, a, it was a humongous green screen set. So it's like, they didn't, they just built it all digitally. So oh, yeah. yeah. And it's all the time, you know, it probably took less time than to build a set. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing because, uh, you know, just going back to the rings, it just reminded me of, of something. I remember being down in the South Island in Queenstown, actually in this area called called Paradise. And it, it was literally Paradise. It was just so beautiful. Yeah. But I remember calling my brother Dino and, you know, calling him and I'm sitting in the middle of this this amazing forest set. And it's like, nobody's going to believe this is real. They're going to think it's all CG, you know, oh but, but it was real. Um, mm -hmm. But that was one of the things, one of the other things that made Lord of the Rings so successful was just the whole look of it of yeah. that we, we we were on location you know for so long and we shot all over New Zealand you know we never left left New Zealand and of course we had a lot of studio time as well um but again I, I one of the other things too that makes Lord of the Rings so successful is that it was all un, done under one roof and what I mean by that is like it was all uh what a what a workshop and what a digital um whereas like an example it's um uh, is like if Lord of the Rings would have been done in the States. Uh, one company would have got the prosthetics, you know, maybe oh, Baker's place. Right. one company would have got the armor and weapons. One company would have got the miniatures and one company would have got the, uh, the digital stuff, you know, maybe like ILM or something like that. And the thing yeah. is that I, that I noticed on a lot of films is that when things are, are separated too much like that, each kind of company kind of puts their own kind of stamp on it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. just, it's just their look that, that they have. And, and a lot of times in films, things just don't quite meld together properly. Yeah. Um, but in this case with Lord of the Rings, as I said, it was all done literally under one roof, you know, under what a workshop as far as all the practical work and all the, uh, the miniatures or they call them the bigotures because they were huge. Um, <laughs> it's just really, just really an incredible stuff. You know, yeah. proof is and nowadays pretty. like actors don't even shoot their scenes together in the same room. They shoot them separately. Especially so, these days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like COVID and everything, but yeah. yeah. And it's gotta be really hard for the actors. And then, and I know a lot of actors that I've talked to that they, they, they really hate it. You know, they, they hate to just being in front of a green screen because they don't have the surroundings to really help them you know, get into the character or just, you know, really emote their expressions and everything and yeah. their emotions of one of their surroundings. So it's, um, but it's the way it's done. JC says, uh, greetings from Chatsworth. I, I hey, JC, how are you? <laughs> Chatsworth, I'll meet you at the, at the, at the, at the pub down there. It was my, my, one of my favorite places there in Chatsworth. It was called, uh, uh, Sagebrush Cantina. Oh, I know this. I know oh. that. Yeah. I know where that yeah, is. That was my hangout. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Jody loves, uh, country music. So there you go. So yeah, a country music fan here. Yeehaw. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> She she loves bluegrass. I know that for a fact. So she's a big bluegrass fan. Nice one. Um, uh, you know, Gino, it's uh, we said this uh, when we talked to you in the, in our pregame uh, little little roundup that we do. Um, 
we've actually almost gone 90 minutes and it's the fastest 90 minutes on the internet. But I also wanted to give some time to Matt and Paul and see what they're carving. Um, oh they've been carving. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Paul's <Yeah>. ready. <laughs> okay. So, so, so emoting, getting a, a golem face out of something that is shaped like that is is uh is a little bit of a challenge so yeah it is really I, I'm, telling yeah, you right so now. <laughs> I'm struggling with it especially the uh what, what is he a board board yeah board so I, I i got a lot of work to do I'm, I'm leaving the eyes for last because the eyes really sell the uh the, <laughs> the golem i'm trying to give him you know drawn in cheeks and stuff I, I got a lot of work to do but but right now he's kind of i gotta make him bored and kind of like, eh, you know, feeling meh, you know, whatever. But you know, anyway. So it's uh, it's 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 gonna take ears because he's got beautiful ears. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm gonna have to cut a big chunk out of the back and make some good ears out of it, um, that that fit him. But it, the toughest part, and Paul will Paul will be my um, my uh, sounding board here when we back up. Carve a specific character, man. It's got to be right, and uh, so uh, I think I got work to do here. But uh, right now, I'm feeling okay with the direction. But right now, it's it's, uh, yeah. blocking, 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 and tackling. Here's Paul. Uh oh. <laughs> no, I agree. I ha I was working with butternut, so the the butternut squash would be this shape. So like that. So I took the bell and I flipped it up because Gollum kind of has pretty much a slightly oval face but it's kind of just a round head right so yeah. i really have to kind of, i had to use the bell i had to use that for a neck which is the mm -hmm. solid part which is really what you want to work with because it's the most material so i'm already like <clears throat> this is squishy like i'm almost through just awesome. To, awesome. Almost, yeah. almost not even close to getting the shape but just something that resembles the bone structure, right? Like gigantic bulbous eyes. The nose is really small for what it is. It's got that really cool sunken in skeletal structure. And he's got that aged, almost ape-like kind of below the lip area. It's, but he's got a little so, tiny chin. He's got he's got this little he's got, no, he's got that apish chin. Yeah, it's all upper lip, not lower lip. And then, so I figure uh, every now and again, I check in and kind of try to throw a half an ear on there or something to see where I'm going. But but like Matt said, lots of blocking right now. Uh I wish I had a little bit more material to deal with. This thing's like a um, like a mad ball. Remember those? Oh. Like a mad ball stress <laughs> ball right now. I could probably cave it in if I squished it hard enough. Don't don't squeeze too hard, Paul. Nope. I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna do it for Gino. Gonna do it for nice. Gino. Looking good. Looking good. Thanks. Nice. Uh Warren says hello. Uh from that, you know, workshop. There you go. Right on. Thanks wow. for Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Literally five minutes from here, just down down the hill. Oh, That's right great. on. And right Warren on. is incredible working with us. You know, back on Lord of the Rings stuff. I just remember the story of him. He came up with a, a great kind of gooey material um, for the uh, for the birthing urukais to be. Oh birthing. yeah, when they come out of the yeah, they, they're yeah. Like around. Yeah. And this was yeah. actually Lertz's uh, Lertz's scene where Lertz is born, and um, but um, but he developed this material which is like a hot melt vinyl that was like a piece this big could like stretch from here to to, to here. It was just really <laughs> incredible stuff. So it was basically like a little sack this big that actually could stretch that a whole body could get inside of it. Wow, and it just looks so cool. So uh, Warren is Warren is very clever. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that, that 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 scene where they're being birthed and he's like screaming to get out of that thing and he's trying to tear it open, it's terrifying. It's 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 such a great iconic uh and you're like, oh my god, this is how they're made? Oh, oh, orcs are gross. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it adds to it so perfectly, so beautifully. And I remember on that on that day, the particular scene with Lurtz being born, uh, the the great uh, uh actor Lawrence McCordy, uh who played Lurtz. Um, he was, uh, we had, we, there was mud and everything. We tried to keep a lot of it out of his face because, uh, we obviously wanted to see his face, but also because he's wearing contact lenses and we didn't want to oh. get any, anything in the lenses at all. But yeah. unfortunately mud had gotten in there and he was such a trooper, even though it was stinging like hell and everything. He, he pulled off the, pulled off the scenes, you know, and, uh, did a, did a great job. 
So, so is just this is probably stupid, and I'll get crucified for this. Is Lurs the uh, the the white hand of Sauron? This way. That's that's oh sorry sorry that way. Okay, that's Jesus, okay. Matt. Get it right. Bro, sorry. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> that's how you learn. I, I apologize. You know, please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one. Yeah, that, yeah, that was the white hand of Sauron. Okay. Uh, because when we had first made up Lawrence as, as Lurtz, um, and we, we even shot him at um, at, a, at a location on on set, and um, Pete watched the rushes on it and came back to us and he said he says oh he's 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 blending in too much with the other Urukais. We need to really make him really stand out. I mean he was standing out physically because he's bigger than all the other yeah, ones. But yeah, still, big. There was something about him because the armor was kind of the similar coloration was similar and everything. So that's why uh, we put gave him a, like a top knot for for his hair. And um, gave him a birthmark across his face, mm -hmm. and then also gave him the white hand of Sauron uh, on his face yeah. this way, which was actually okay. my hand. That was the last part of the man. Cut it out. Oh, wow. yeah, and uh, so put that on that way. So he's, he's the only one that has the the handprint like that. All the other ones have uh, have it, you know, this way or other other directions. But that's what really made them stand out as as oh words. And I love that you thought about that for that reason to make yeah. it stand out, right? Just the one hand is going the opposite way. Matt didn't know that. I knew that. Okay. I'm yeah, just I'm saying. I'm just saying. I, I, I met this way. I did that. <laughs> Matt, you know everything about that movie. You have a Balrog head behind you. you you're I, I the do, expert but, but, in this But movie. apparently I don't know Besides that. Team. I'm going to get a knock at the door in about 10 minutes, and they're going to be like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your Lord of the Rings card. You're, you're gone. <laughs> you're never allowed in the Shire again. Yeah. There's a scene in the in the Fellowship of the Ring of uh, at uh, the location on, on in the film is called Amon Hen, and it's where uh, Lurtz and his his troop of Urukai are going out to try to find the the halflings. And uh, when we're filming that that day, there's <clears throat> there's one scene in the beginning where it's actually Lurtz without the top knot and and the the handprint on there. They they left that in there just because it was kind of a wide shot, but you can still pick out. Lawrence in there, and it was funny also because of his teeth. A lot of the actors, you know, they they they're sort of like this and can't really speak yeah. properly. Yeah. So Lawrence is is yelling, you know, find the halflings, find the halflings, find. Yeah. But it sounded like find the ducklings, find the ducklings. <laughs> so, <laughs> cracking up on set, and he's going, what, what? I said, it sounds like you're saying ducklings. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, Gino, we, we, we have so much more to talk about. I'm just going to oh, whip through some of, your, some of your work here. Yeah. We're going to have to have you back. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. You're going to just have to uh, just have to come back because, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. so much to talk about. Uh, Spawn. Unbelievable uh, that you did Independence Spawn, Day. Um, you know, oh, Godzilla. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Like like so much more. We, we I want to hear about all of this. And, um, yeah. and I, you do you do other types of, of masks and other artwork. Uh, again, I'm just flipping through this. I mean, it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, we saw this one before. Uh, and then um, we talked a little bit about Demolition Man. Definitely would want to hear more about this one. But then I, I saw this. I saw this when you gave this to me. This one, this one was absolutely outstanding. I couldn't believe that, that you were a part of this one. Uh, Matt LeBlanc in Ed. Uh, I mean, he's a baseball fan, so like this is this is for me. This is like outstanding. Like I just couldn't believe it. Um, we definitely want to talk that, more that, about this. That film won that film won so many Oscars. <laughs> it did. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and it's funny because there, I believe that there's a, there's a press conference by Matt LeBlanc, and you can tell that he does not want to talk about this movie. <laughs> and it's, it's it's really uncomfortable, but I, I I love it just for the fact of it's you know baseball movie with with uh, with a chimpanzee and. and but the movie. makeup is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And Absolutely. again, another ape. You got to do yes. one that you you love yeah, to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And it all and comes around. So like you were you were doing it back then and, and did it for your daughter. For your daughter. And, and then it's in the movies. But um if you want to check out Gino's work, this is where you can find him on Instagram. Is there anywhere else where we can find uh your work and or anything that you're doing? Uh Instagram's probably the, the uh the best place. And then I've got a, I've got a website. It's Gino Acevedo uh <laughs> Gino Acevedo art.com. <laughs> Okay. Um, where, I, where I do a lot of uh, artwork and prints, sell prints and things like that. So you can see some of my artwork there. Amazing right. illustrations too. Absolutely. Yes. Unbelievable. Yes. 
we definitely have so much more to talk about. I, I think we could, this could be like a f three or four parter um, just to talk about your, your illustrious career. Um, but this is where you can find us. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. Uh, guys, any last words before we sign off for uh, this week? Oh, I would like to thank this guy right here for taking the time to sit down with us. We're gigantic fans and you've done so much stuff that I didn't know you did. I'm an even bigger fan now because of all of these movies and movies that I look to and got in for inspiration from it, I don't want to call it stealing, but yes, I've basically stolen most of your stuff <laughs> and tried to carve it on a pumpkin or clay or whatever it is growing up. Like, you know, whatever you've done is always amazing. And it's just, it's an honor to actually sit down and hang out with you and, you're a great guy and you're so approachable, which is another thing that is makes you even even better, right? Like you, you're a nice guy and you're amazingly talented. So hopefully, like if there's any young guys and girls watching the show, they take a little information from this and they can do it too. Yeah, I don't know if they'll end up in New Zealand. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, but it's yeah, been great. I've, I've been very, very blessed and you know, I've been very lucky to have such a great career and uh and to have worked and met with some, you know, such incredibly talented people that a lot of them are my dear friends, you know, uh, today. And uh, just a shout out to Martin Mercer out there. I just got your message. Um, but hey. yeah, it's, it's been great. It's just, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I live with a philosophy of treat people the way that you want to be treated. And I think that'll take you a long way. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. It doesn't always my work only, out. Only, but, sorry, I'm sorry, Jim. As I said, I said it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't always work out that way, but it's, you try. You do your best, right? Yeah, my, my only thing to say is, I mean, the, the passion you had from being a, a teenager into this to, to where you are today is, is infectious. And it's like so fun to see where you've gone with just having that passion and following it and going after it and just and kind of saying, you know, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. I'm just so impressed with that. And just also just your your, your body of work is, is tremendous. And to, for three dipshits like us and I'm, I'm saying that nicely right mickey and paul no, it makes sense but to be able to get to hang out with you is just it's just it's just an honor and just so you know bottom of my heart thank you for for hanging out with us and uh we'd love to have you back on and, and chat with you more but regardless um we're just really grateful to have you here tonight definitely well let's keep in touch it's great to see you yes. guys. absolutely one rule though if you're going to come back on i need to see a gino carved pumpkin Ooh. <laughs> You got I'll, send you tools. I'll send you a bunch of uh, clay tools. I'm sure you don't have any of those anywhere. Uh, <laughs> I'll send you pumpkin seeds, and then we can all go to jail for whatever that time. <laughs> for orange pumpkins. <laughs> well, we'll be back next Thursday, but for you, Gino, it'll be Friday with another <laughs> Carvers and Creators. Make sure uh, thank you, Gino, for being our special guest, and uh, it was a thank pleasure, you. and we will see you next Thursday for another Carvers and Creators. Good night, everyone. Take care. See you guys. Take care.